media-based independent historian and historic preservation consultant who works with preservation organizations, historic sites, nonprofit organizations, and academic institutions on issues related to diversity and historic site interpretations. Free's past clients include the National Park Service, Hanbury uh, Preservation Consulting, the Raleigh Historic Development Commission, and the Nevada Preservation Foundation and Heritage Ohio, Inc. He was the first director uh, for diversity at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. That's a big deal. Uh, the National, for, we don't have a preservation program here at the school, um, but the National Trust for Historic Preservation in that world is, is the organization. So he was the first director of diversity there. He's also served as a featured speaker, moderator, and panelists for a number of national and statewide and local historic preservation organizations and conferences um, on issues related to diversity within the historic preservation movement. Uh, Free was appointed to Virginia's Board of Historic Resources. He also currently serves as board chair of the Rainbow Heritage Network, a national organization that advocates for preservation of historic sites related to the history of the LGBTQ com uh, community. He contributed to, I'm gonna move on. Uh, Free also uh, served on the board of trustees for the DC Preservation League and has served as an advisor to the DC chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects. Uh, currently he's been conducting research on the nation's uh, music related historic places so as to advocate for uh, better for their preservation. So he's a major person uh, in this area. Um, we have two other speakers, both from Barrow Architects in Rochester because uh, uh, um, Thomas Boyd Jr.'s career really was largely, uh, after he graduated from Syracuse University, was largely um, occurred in, in Rochester. And, and this firm in Rochester has been doing a lot of work, preservation and other work on, on uh, Thomas Boyd Jr. Um, one of the two speakers tonight from Barrow is, uh, is Christopher Brandt. He's a project architect at Barrow with experience in multiple facets of historic preservation, uh, including design and construction administration, building evaluation research and advocacy. Uh, he received a Bachelor of Science in Architecture at the University of Buffalo uh, in 2011 and a Master's and Certificate in Historic Preservation at UVA, University of Virginia, I should say. Um, and our third speaker is Katie uh, Como. Uh, Katie joined the staff of Barrow Architects in 2010 as the firm's architectural historian. She works on a range of projects, including historic resource surveys, national register nominations, and rehabilitation tax credit applications. She received her uh, BA in the humanities from Yale University and an MS in preservation um, at the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I, I, think, uh, I think in fact um, that Katie is gonna be the first speaker and she's gonna talk a little bit more about the other players on the team and the project in general. So, uh, join me in welcoming Katie Como tonight. Okay, I think my mic is on, right? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. We are just delighted to be here. It, there's nothing like the energy of a college campus. For those of us who haven't been um, in, on one as a regular part of our lives in a while, it really is something special. And uh, to be here at Syracuse is really special for me as well. Um, so I, I'm going to introduce, well, we've, you've had our team introduced. Okay, this is not going forward. There we go, okay. Um, and then I'm going to talk about kind of what we're doing with this project. And I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to Thomas Boyd's uh, life. And then Free is going to talk about Boyd in kind of a national context. And Chris is going to focus on his uh, buildings. So that's kind of what we're, how we've decided to break it up for tonight. So in terms of our team, this is the five of us. Three of us are here tonight, obviously Chris and me, and then Gina DiBella is with us in the front row as well. And you know that Free is with us remotely. Um, the firm that Chris and I work for, Barrow Architecture, does do preservation work specifically. And if anyone is interested, Chris may talk about this or you can ask him about why an architect wants to go into preservation because it's what he's wanted to do since he was very little. Um, 
The two of us plus Gina worked on a previous project documenting the work of the architect James Johnson in Rochester. So if anyone is from Rochester, you'll know the Mushroom House is his most famous work. Um, and uh, following that, because we had a lot of success with that project, the same client, which is the Greece Historical Society from the town of Greece, not the country of Greece, um, wanted us to do another project. And, and so we're doing this project on Thomas Boyd. Uh, Gina did a lot of the legwork to kind of set it all up. And so I want to acknowledge that, you know, she found some uh, grants for us for this. So our sponsors, uh, financial sponsors are the Preservation League of New York State, New York State Council on the Arts and the Rochester Area Community Foundation. So once we had our, our funding lined up and knew we were going to do this project, we felt it was really important to uh, broaden our team because we felt that we would be able to talk about Boyd within the context of Rochester architecture but we really needed someone who could look at the broader picture of Boyd in terms of being a, an, an African-American architect of the mid 20th century and kind of talk about that national level context. So that's why we brought Free onto our team because we knew as, as uh, the Dean said, he's a major person in this field and is really such an expert in African-American history. And then Alexis is our uh, recent college graduate who's helping us out as uh, a research assistant as well. So what we're hoping to do with this project is to really raise awareness of Thomas Boyd. We're all preservationists, that's, that's kind of our core and what we do, and wanting to make sure that his works are preserved and taken good care of for future generations. And of course, the first step in that is to make sure that people know about him and know what they have. And uh, the building in this photograph is an example of that where the owners had been told that their uh, house was designed by a different um, architect. So misattribution is obviously one um, potential problem. But generally speaking, people you know, care about and take care of what they know and appreciate. So that's the first step is really making sure that, that people know about a Boyd and what he um, was all about. Secondly, there has been kind of a, a narrative about Boyd that we would like to correct. And this newspaper headline really says it all. Uh, it's completely untrue. <laughs> he, as you're gonna see, he left hundreds of buildings and maybe not all of them rise to the level of what we would call a landmark, but that doesn't mean that they're not important and that this is not an important legacy. Uh, so we want to make sure that we change the story, which has been kind of focused on controversy around a few big projects and how large a role he had, and that we're really talking about the things he really did do. So the, the format of all of this without getting into too much detail is basically that by us doing this research, presenting a biography of Boyd, talking about um, his buildings and what makes them important. If you have somebody who owns a house by Thomas Boyd or some other building, we're making it easier for them to, if they want to pursue some kind of landmark designation. So the way we're doing this, uh, starting by documenting as much as we possibly can using materials that Boyd himself produced or collected. And fortunately, his family donated a lot of materials after he died to the Rochester Museum and Science Center. So Chris and Gina and Alexis have been spending a lot of time going through the archives there, through his drawings, through newspaper clippings that he collected, which often are good clues because if he cut it out, chances are he designed the building, whether he was mentioned in the article or not. And then other just general items that he kept. This is his military service pins. So there's interesting items like that in that collection. We know, and I think Free is going to talk about this, that often the uh, written and collected documentary record is not a complete picture. And so one way to get a more complete picture is through oral history interviews. And here we are interviewing Thomas Boyd's son, Thomas W. Boyd III. So you see Free in the uh, video there. You see Chris's knee in the lower right corner. And then Gina and I were back. Gina took the picture and I was back by Gina. So we all had the opportunity to meet uh, the younger Mr. Boyd, which was really quite a treat. We're interviewing uh, other family members, colleagues, friends, people who really knew Thomas Boyd firsthand and can give us a more complete picture through, through their, their personal recollections. So we're partway through this process of the documentation and the interviews. We haven't found everything we're gonna find yet, but we're, we're at a good kind of midway point where we can share what we've done so far. And one of the things that's very important to us in terms of our approach from kind of a more conceptual standpoint is to emphasize Thomas Boyd as an architect. And that seems obvious. And yet when we look back at the articles people have written in the past or the research reports people have done, we see that often they kind of stop at 
first African American architect in Rochester, and don't really talk about the buildings that he actually did. So we want to make sure that we're bringing attention not just to his importance as a, a pioneer for who he was, but also what he did and what he really accomplished as an architect. Because, like I, I mentioned, I mean he he was responsible for the design of hundreds of buildings in the Rochester area. And at a time when Rochester and the suburbs in particular were growing very quickly, he just did hundreds and hundreds of very well-designed, well-built houses and other, other types of buildings as well. But he was, he, he told people he was particularly proud of the residential work. So that's, that's a major focus for us. So to talk a little bit about his life, he was born on Christmas day in 1905 in Washington, DC. Uh, he lived with his parents. He had two older siblings and eventually a younger sibling as well. And their original, the home when he was born was uh, near the U.S. Capitol, Capitol Hill neighborhood of D.C. They then moved to the northwest part of D.C. and lived first in the Reno Park neighborhood and eventually the Droit Park neighborhood. He attended Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, which was built just a few years before he got there. So this is a photograph of that school. And this uh, is known as having been the best high school in the country for African-American students. Schools throughout the country at that time were segregated um, and uh, higher education as well. So it was difficult for African-American graduates who had even PhDs to find teaching jobs at universities. Um, so they, they, this um, was a very uh, special school because in Washington DC by law, African-American and white teachers had to be paid the same. So this was one of the few places where an African-American with a PhD who wanted to teach could actually get a job and be paid the same as their white colleagues. Although of course they were not teaching at the level they should have been teaching. They should have been teaching at the college level. But this was a school that attracted a, a really remarkable number of people with PhD and master degrees. So this caption says this was the greatest Negro high school in, in the world. I think we could argue this was probably one of the best high schools in the world period because of the exceptional quality of the staff with all those PhDs. So Thomas Boyd um, knew from a very young age that he wanted to be an architect and an engineer. He had a tremendous aptitude for math and design. We don't know quite um, where he got that inspiration from. His dad had been a mechanic and a chauffeur, so there's probably some mechanical ability there. Uh, but when he graduated in 1923, he pursued kind of an unusual educational path, which I've outlined here, starting at Brown University for a year. We don't know then quite where he was the fall of 1924, but in the upper right there, that's his enrollment card from the University of Michigan for the spring semester of 1925, studying engineering and architecture. And he's in the photograph with his fraternity brothers there. He is uh, in the bottom right corner. Uh, so he spent then an additional academic year at Michigan, did another year at Minnesota, always studying both architecture and engineering, and then finally came here to Syracuse University, I think in this very building, 1927 to 28. While he was here at Syracuse, he uh, was very successful. These are both photographs related to um, a contest that he entered. The uh, uh, owners of the State Tower building downtown, which had been completed recently, uh, held the contest for students to do a rendering of the building, I guess probably a promotional thing for them. And so Boyd is here on the right with his rendering. And then on the left, he and some fellow students and professors are looking at some other student work from the contest. Uh, and he ended up coming in third in, the, in that contest. We also found a mention of another national level contest, but we don't know too much about it, but he um, got an uh, honorable mention award and whatever that contest was still kind of digging into that. So here's his uh, diploma from Syracuse University on the left. And then on the right, this is a fun document. In uh, 1938, on the occasion of his 10th reunion, they submitted this questionnaire and the students filled out what they'd been doing for the last 10 years. So this is really a gold mine because there are a lot of stories floating around about what he may or may not have been doing during that period. But if you put it on the form, we're taking it as uh, the, the official word on what he was up to. So one of the thing he mentioned on the, on the um, form for his period, you know, soonest to graduation was that he spent a year working in Albany at the state architect's office. Um, there's also the possibility that he worked, well, we know he was working in New York City by the spring of 1930. We don't quite know what he was doing, but his family believes he was working at Schultz and Weaver, which was a very prominent firm there. 
This photograph was taken in February 1930. So I've seen a caption that it was the state architect's office and it may be, but it could also be his work in, in New York City. We don't quite know. So the reason we know that by the spring of 1930, he was in New York City is because that's when he responded to an ad in the newspaper from the architect, Sid, the architect Sidman Firestone in Rochester. Um, so they corresponded back and forth. They spoke on the phone. Firestone invited Boyd to come up to Rochester for an interview and hired him very soon thereafter. Uh, he started within a couple weeks of this letter from April 16th, 1930. Firestone's firm, in addition to Firestone himself, had three architects and three engineers, and they had more work than they could handle just then because they had uh, been working on a very large county project. This is the, it's now known as the Monroe Community Hospital. And Chris is gonna talk a little bit about this building. So Boyd was brought in and, and must have made quite an impression on them right away because we know he had a very significant role in the design of this major building. So he stayed at Sigmund Firestone's office for three years up until 1933, and then began what we think of as kind of an itinerant period of his career when he was in a lot of different jobs. I suspect that wasn't uncommon at that time. This was the Great Depression when architectural commissions just totally dried up and, and it was very difficult for architects to keep their staffs intact and um, to uh, find work at all. So we know that in mid 1930s, he worked for first the um, New York State Temporary Emergency Relief Administration, which was the kind of jobs creation program in the depression, and then for the Works Progress Administration. And he worked on the, what was called initially the Lakeshore Survey. This is his reassignment card from when he switched from state employment to federal employment. And he worked on the design of bridges. And uh, this was for what ultimately became the Lake Ontario State Parkway. He also maintained his connections in Washington, DC, still had a residence there as well, and worked for the architect Albert Cassell on um, some buildings at Howard University, as well as a housing complex, which I think is this one here, Mayfair Mansions Apartments. He also uh, worked for a number of different firms in Rochester, kept working off and on for Sigmund Firestone, as well as uh, the office of Frank Quinlan, and also Gordon and Kelber. Uh, this is a um, grouping of buildings that he did with uh, Frank Quinlan's office. And he received his architectural license in 1940. And then during World War II, his war service came in the form of engineering work for two different companies. First, J.G. White Engineering, and then for Curtis Wright Company, which was a major producer of military aircraft uh, during the war. And the, the memo on the right is from his work in uh, his engineering work with Curtis Wright, and it had to do with calculating equipment for moving large airplane parts from place to place. So we know that's at least one thing he did during that time period. So very significant uh, war service um, during uh, World War II. In 1947, he started his own architectural practice um, after working a couple more years for, for Sigmund Firestone. And um, he was active in that practice until almost up until his death in 1981. Um, and during that time period, he did some uh, work around kind of social issues, particularly housing, but it doesn't seem to have been a major focus for him. He, he didn't actually do a lot of federal work, which is unusual for African-American architects of the time. He did mostly private commissions. Um, and um, so a few things we heard about him, just to kind of just finish off with a few observations about his, uh, his personality and his career overall. He was very prolific, as you'll see when Chris shows you some examples of his work. Everyone described him as being very detail-oriented, meticulous, you know, in, in the way he dressed, in the way he uh, spoke with people, and, and very math-brained. His son told us that he, he didn't, they didn't play baseball together, they played math games. Um, he was very devoted to his career. He was a good listener from what everybody told us. We spoke to a colleague who worked with him. Um, she was a, an interior designer and her very first project coming out of college was on a, on a project with Thomas Boyd. And she said, even though she was brand new and he was very established in his career, he listened to her, he took her input and treated her like a professional. And she thought that just got her off to such a great start in her career to be treated that way in her very first job. Um, we also know he worked very closely individually with his clients. He didn't design cookie cutter houses or buildings. He really was attuned to each person's needs and, and how they wanted their buildings to be. 
He uh, had gotten married just before moving up to Rochester and they eventually had three children. Um, you saw Thomas W. Boyd III is still alive. Um, and what his son told us, uh, his son also became an architect and they worked together early in the son's career. Um, and so he, he described kind of some of the projects they'd worked on together and, and what it was like working with his dad. But what he really wanted to tell us and wanted us to tell the world is that his dad really had a God gifted talent is how he put it for architecture and engineering. And that he just was a, a tremendously um, hardworking and talented person who in his son's eyes really never got the recognition that he deserved. And also probably never got the level of um, you know, jobs and success during his life that he would have as prolific as he was, his son feels like he, he could have had a lot more success had he been a white architect and been kind of more recognized during his lifetime. So with that, I am going to turn us over to Free and we're gonna bring him up on the screen here to talk a little bit more about Boyd and that, and that larger context. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. <clears throat> so as noted, and it does feel odd to be a bit disembodied from everybody else. My name is Jeffrey Harris. I'm known in the preservation world by my nickname of Free. And what I want to talk to you about, I'm going to put on my, my old historian hat for you. So please don't go to sleep. That's all I ask. Um, in terms of Boyd, what I really wanted to focus on was to talk about the sort of historic context that African-American professionals found themselves in during the sort of early 20th century, moving into the mid 20th century. And what you often find is that you have various limitations. It was almost as though those professionals in order to get from say high school to their professional positions, they had to go through an interesting series of obstacle courses just to A, get into school, then B, get through school, then find their way into their careers. And we actually yesterday I spoke with one of Mr. Boyd's uh, good friends, a Dr. Walter Cooper, who is a retired Kodak chemist. Um, and he talked about, you know, as, as we all, as we both knew, that a number of African-Americans who trained in the various professions often found themselves in positions where they could not practice what they studied. And lots of them ended up either teaching or there were a number of African-American men who um, became sleeping car porters, the Pullman sleeping car porters, if you are familiar with the name A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of that union. You know, you have that element going through and other people turn to, you know, aspects of being entrepreneurs because they did have a captive audience within the segregated space. So with that in mind, if you think about the obstacles that people had to go through, you also had gatekeepers. Now, during what's generally seen as the progressive era uh, of the early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century, you had a number of professions become or get organized. They wanted to professionalize what they did. They wanted to make sure that you know, people met standards. Now with architects, the AIA was established in 1857. So they were pretty early. They were, they were before that period. But once you get sort of post-Civil War and into the post-Reconstruction era, you really have a hardening of what people want to do. And those gatekeepers absolutely did a point of making sure that African-Americans had very limited access, if any access at all, to the traditional avenues that led into their professions. And architects certainly were a part of that, which is, is sad when you think about the history of African-Americans in the built environment. And we're talking going all the way back to slavery, you have people who were trained artisans. You have people who more or less were architects, engineers, carpenters. They did, all, they did so many of the buildings that we've seen, particularly in the South, that we understand that idea of a building arts tradition, but still being kept out of the formal processes and formal business structures and formal in, you know, organizations that would help them you know, hone their skills even to a greater degree. So with that in mind, one of the things that is of particular interest that I've found over the years, and I didn't realize it until well into graduate school for myself, was that African-American professionals 
tended to, for the most part, fall into the camps of either working with government, and it, we're talking from federal to local levels, or they were entrepreneurs for the most part. So if you think about, actually for the African-Americans who are in the room, if you think about your families, particularly if they are working class to you know, sort of upper middle class, even wealthy, Think about the background of your grandparents and great grandparents if they went to colleges or universities early on. They either ended up as, you know, being teachers, being working, you know, say the post office, working in some form of government, or they became business people. They worked within the African American community, you know, providing goods and services that provided a safe space for them not to have to engage with, with, white, with white folks for the most part. So I often find that very interesting when you look at that, that the idea of upward mobility, so that in an interesting way, a lot of African-American professionals, even with limited opportunities, did tend to find relatively steady work when, they, when it could happen. And as, you, you see, as you'll see with Boyd, he found steady work both you know using the sort of governmental perspective working you know from the local level to the state level to federal projects and also being his own boss being an entrepreneur being an independent architect so you know i say that just to to make it clear that though there were challenges people still could maintain you know manage to become rather successful but again there were obstacles you had to be quick nimble and have the ability to maneuver around you know constantly changing circumstances and you know always worrying about who is going to possibly stab you in the back who may not pay you will you get the opportunity will you be given a shot so with that in mind, I'm, I'm trying to move my way through some elements, some of the, the classical history sides, but I wanted to talk about elements of document challenges. Now, one of the things that I've talked about, you know, I'm going to put my preservation hat on really quickly. Um, I talked about a, a concept of who built America, and I'd referenced that earlier. And if you think about various buildings that you know from the White House to the US Capitol, African Americans have had, multi generational African Americans have had a very strong presence in the building arts. We always have. That work was done by us, sometimes for us, oftentimes for other people. And that, and if you, as you move forward thinking about that, you look at issues of erasure. Lots of people did not think about who actually built places like the White House, places like the US Capitol. Interestingly, you know, we, we tend to ignore what we don't, you know, we tend to ignore what we don't necessarily want to talk about. And if you have an opportunity to take credit for something that someone else has done, you'll take the advantage of that. And unfortunately, throughout our history, in terms of you know some of the architectural marvels that we've seen you know over you know throughout our throughout our country's history, that erasure is done. You don't hear about who built those things. You don't hear about those who've been trained to actually do that work, which is which is unfortunate, and that causes difficult. That is a problem for us who are going back, doing the research in terms of documenting who is doing what. Fast forward, if you look at you know. African American architects who work for firms that aren't African American firms, there are instances when you do have stories of great projects that are done, but you don't hear about until decades later, well after someone has passed, that an African American had a hand on it. And one of the great examples that's come out in the last, say, 15 years was Duke University's you know, primary campus. The architect Julian Abel was the principal designer of. Duke, and if any of you know, you all are architecture students, you all probably have a sense of, of sense of what Duke University looks like. It is an incredibly beautiful, not to shade anybody else's school, but it's an incredibly beautiful structure. And I was I was floored when I discovered that an African American architect was the principal designer of that space. That is something that I had not learned. I learned that well into my maybe third year working in historic preservation. <laughs> which is which is an incredible thing to be able to say. 
And it, of course, it, it, you know, you begin to wonder, what else have we not, you know, what else do we not know? What other architecture firms who may have been, you know, willing to hire the African-American architect, you know, did not share with the world that that person did the work. And in some instances, they may not have been able to. Duke University is in North Carolina. Julian Abel was not able to go to Durham, North Carolina to actually check on the progress of that work because he would not have been allowed for the, all the obvious reasons that we know. So in some instances, you have people who did the shady thing and did not share with the world the African-Americans who actually did the architectural work. And you have practical reasons where people absolutely could not do that. Now we do get luckier with solo practitioners like Boyd who actually could leave, would leave a record behind for those of us who are coming behind them to examine, look through, and you know, present opportunities for us to really make sure that we could go back and credit the work that they've done over the course of their careers. And that is a wonderful thing to do. One of the things that you do run into though, is the concern with what I would call the minimization of someone's work and the over embellishment of someone's work. So when you are thirsty, for lack of a better way of putting it, for information about individuals doing particular things, you recognize that they may not have been given the necessary accolades that they deserved in the past. But what can happen in recognizing that is that we can sometimes over embellish. You know, so you get a sense of, did you hear about the black person who designed the Statue of Liberty? Which of course we know that isn't the, isn't the case. But you can find yourself in a circumstance where for historians, for architectural historians, you're having to go, you're having to work your way through the oral history record that exists and trying to match it up with the documented history that you can find. And what I fall into is a sense of, can we please let the work of the people that we're focusing on, let their work speak for itself. Yes, there are going to be instances when we do find that the person, you know, we may have heard this wild embellishment actually is the truth. But what we don't want is to find ourselves in a circumstance where we've put out something that has been said about an individual. And it turns out later on that we were actually incorrect. And we simply, you know, followed what someone said without being able to document it. And those those are the types of challenges that we all can face as we're doing this sort of work. You want to get it right because you want to give credit where credit is due, but you don't want to get to a point where you're bogged down and you're going, basically you're, you're, chasing, <laughs> you're chasing butterflies across, you know, different genres, different eras, you know, trying to piece things together that in the end really turn out not to be great. What I really, I'm gonna divert a little bit from, just a little bit, from my sort of written text to, to really go back and look at the relationships that I think, and we're still doing research on this. I know I am in terms of trying to find Boyd and place him within his broader context. But as I, as I was going through my preparation for this presentation, one of the things I thought of were the number of African-American architects that Boyd you know, certainly worked with and those that he likely had a relationship with. So if you think about someone like a Vertner Woods, Woodson Tandy, who is the first licensed African-American architect in New York, and he was the, uh, the designer of Villa Luaro, which was the home of Madam C.J. Walker in Irvington, New York. Boyd certainly did some work with him during his time in New York City. Then if you think about, you know, as, as Katie showed, Albert Cassell, um, you know, he, Boyd certainly did work with him both at Howard University, did work with him at Morgan State, and also that was able to, that brought Boyd home to Washington, D.C. So we know that they had that relationship. Then you think about the architect, the African-American architect, Hilliard Robinson. Now, Hilliard Robinson is a little older than Thomas Boyd, but he was also a DC native. And Hilliard Robinson was the one who designed uh, this place called Langston Terrace uh, Dwellings, 
a very large um, African-American housing project in DC that came during the, um, if I'm not mistaken, I need to double check to make sure I get this right, but came during the, uh, during the whole Great Depression era to make sure that, or in the war era, to make sure that African-Americans had housing. And this was probably a part of the time when they were moving African-Americans out of the old Southwest part of DC and you know, doing the classic quote unquote Negro removal and needed housing, new housing for them in a different part of town. So he likely knew him. I'm more than sure that Boyd heard of Paul Revere Williams, you know, the architect of Hollywood. You know, he was the, uh, Williams was the first African-American member of the AIA. So I'm more than sure that that came through. And because when you think about the work that, that Boyd did in terms of individual housing, like Williams, who did similar things, you know, I'm sure that they had that, they, that he was aware of him. And then I also would guess that Boyd is familiar with Norma Merrick uh, Sklala. I always get her name right. Skylar, Skylarak. I always get her name wrong. But she was the first African-American woman who was licensed uh, to practice as an architect in New York. And she, did, you know, so I'm thinking that, you know, as I'm looking at sort of Boyd within his milieu of his profession, there's no question in my mind that though he may not have mentioned a number of these people in the writings that we've seen, and his son did not necessarily, say, didn't mention him talking about a number of other architects, just by looking at his contemporaries within that time and knowing what his, his work, you know, you know, where he worked and what he was doing, it made me feel good to remind myself that of course he would have known some of the other African-Americans, you know, who were architects during his time. And of course, he probably had conversations with them or had some elements of inspiration, even though his favorite architect I've now heard for the second time, um, my colleagues don't know that I actually did finish that interview yesterday. <laughs> um, and Frank Lloyd Wright was mentioned as the favorite architect again. So with that, I just want to pass things on to over to Chris, but I hope you have a, a better sense, and as I tighten things up for myself, a better sense of Thomas Boyd and in sort of a broader historical context of African-American architects in the early to mid 20th century and the peers that were out there with him, you know, folks who would have inspired him, folks with whom he worked with, and, and perhaps maybe even people that may that he may have inspired, you know, to do other things. So thank you for your time. Okay, yeah, it's on. So we've already sort of touched on this a little bit uh, before I jump into uh, showing some of the wonderful buildings that Thomas Boyd designed, sort of where, where are we now as far as our, our project team, what have we learned as well as where are we are now um, as a profession. So we've touched on it. Uh, certainly we have more interviews to do. Um, Free has already been digging uh, deeply into Thomas Boyd's other professional peers. Um, during his era and as a profession and obviously just to really uh, emphasize I'm sure many, many of you especially um, the younger students here are fully aware of how our profession continues to struggle and continues to be really a ground for white men um, to uh, design and that continues to be a sort of intractable problem that has a lot of value signaling to try to make things better but the actual work's not being done um, so I would implore all of you to uh, sort of make your concerted efforts to really actually make the effort here on the ground and to elevate and celebrate the works of people like Thomas Boyd and uh, others that we've mentioned before. So until we have Robert Taylor, until we have Norma Scarlick, until we have Paul Williams being celebrated as much as Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright being studied in schools, uh, the work is not done. 
So a quick summary of uh, Thomas Boyd's career, um, and Katie touched on most of this. So in 1928, he graduated from here, from, uh, from SU, and then had a period of itinerant work as a draftsman and designer, and then achieving his licensure as, as an architect in 1940, and then his uh, sort of war work, and then he had his sort of 35-year-long uh, career as a sole practitioner. And during that time, uh, so far, we're up to 550 projects and counting. Um, the sheer volume of work and, cre and creativity um, that uh, Boyd has exhibited is uh, really sort of uh, shocking. If you ever want to feel uh, really inadequate as an architect, all you got to do is go through uh, Mr. Boyd's um, archives and see the amount of work that he was able to complete uh, in such a short period of time. Uh, so one of the earliest projects that he worked on, and this is one that was sort of, uh, is always sort of touted and talked about uh, with Boyd's legacy is Monroe Community Hospital. And this is the project that had the controversy that everyone sort of focuses on and doesn't sort of celebrate or pay attention to the rest of uh, Boyd's career. And this is always sort of pointing attention between the Firestone family as well as Boyd's family. Uh, and so he was hired by Sigmund Firestone and his firm to work on this very this sort of massive project. And um, depending on who you ask, if you asked uh, a sort of descendant on the Firestone family side, they would say, well, Boyd was just hired as a mere draftsman. He never had any participation in the project. But we, what we know from looking through the drawings, um, uh, Thomas Boyd had a very signature drafting style and a craftsmanship to his drawings that makes them stand out immediately compared to any of his other colleagues that were working on this project um, in the sort of team that produced it. So there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of drawings that look like this. Um, that are all uh, by Boyd's hand. And Boyd had this very uh, intimate, very detailed understanding of how the materials went together, the design of them, the incorporation of the beautiful colors that are so well known for this building. So he absolutely had a huge hand uh, in the design uh, of this very early project, very early in his career. There's a couple of pictures of it today. Uh, and then, uh, as Katie mentioned, another really recent or, or really early project in his career was uh, designing a series of bridges for the uh, Lake Ontario State Parkway. And so this allowed him to sort of flex his muscles both as a structural, his training in structural engineering as well as an architect and designer. And he produced a number of different designs um, for the State Park Commission. And they eventually sort of settled on this more sort of simple uh, Medina sandstone structure that is still standing there today. Um, it's very hard to photograph, so I apologize for the Google Street View. Um, and then uh, as part of the project, as it was being built, there were also ancillary supporting structures to the parkway when it was constructed. So it's very likely that Boyd was also the chief designer um, for this now unfortunately abandoned uh, service station. Another early project, and this is again sort of more in the sort of uh, traditional uh, design aesthetic that, that Boyd practiced in early in his career are a series of these sort of Tudor revival style buildings that were built for St. Joseph's Villa. It was an orphan asylum and was designed as a sort of village of uh, multiple sort of iterative designs of this structure that you see here. And again, Boyd's very signature craftsmanship with his drawings and how he lettered, dimensioned, designed, et cetera, makes them jump out immediately. And so well over half of the drawings for this project were all completed by him all of the exterior elevations, so how the building appears just from the exterior, as well as the detailed drawings of how to construct it, calculations for the structural loads, all of them in Boyd's hand. There's sort of a little aerial view in today. And then one of his early projects, he did sort of moonlight uh, while he was working at other firms. So there are a handful of small projects in his archives where um, he is designing buildings, one he's working anywhere from when he was in DC working for Albert Castle or back in Rochester working for Frank Quinlan. Uh, this is an early house, the Ward residence, again, in that more traditional um, design aesthetic, but still the level sort of craftsmanship and care and understanding of uh, the uh, sort of material quality of the building that he was designing for this client. Um, but once he breaks out into his own, he really uh, begins to sort of transform and focus on more modern design aesthetics and pulling a lot of inspiration um, from Frank Lloyd Wright and from others practicing in the middle of the 20th century. And his uh, sort of main um, really sort of strength was designing uh, the sort of modern mid-century modern ranches. Um, this first one here, the Freeman residence is probably a really good example of a lot of his sort of hallmarks in his designs. Um, and he had these sort of very exuberant, almost wandering floor plans that uh, allow for creating framed views through primary public spaces of the house, as well as uh, creating privacy 
and these sort of diagonal sort of corner, view, uh, corner views out of bedrooms. Um, also, uh, you're probably seeing it there on the plan there. He'd love to have sort of prolific use of curved wall surfaces as a sort of point of drama. And his common materials of using very sleek, modern, paired back flat materials lend themselves well to these sort of curved wall surfaces. You can see a couple of the interior shots there um, with these sort of you know, floor to ceiling uh, wood panel walls carrying through. And uh, a lot of his uh, sort of uh, primary living spaces, he had a bit of uh, sort of sense of theatricality where you uh, create these sort of a level of grandeur entering into and out of a space or having these sort of broad um, sort of processional almost entrances between spaces where you see or between the living room and the dining room. And you'll see that time and time again through a lot of his work. And then his interest in new and uh, cutting edge materials that maybe you know, weren't the most straightforward. So this does look like a pretty typical bathroom, but what's more notable about it is uh, the use of vitrolite, which was a very sort of modern uh, pigmented glass that was used frequently um, in the mid-century and really plays again into boys' interest in using these very sleek, smooth materials. The Grossman residence, so this is more similar to uh, a lot of his uh, other work. It's maybe a little more uncommon uh, for the that first house being wood clad. Uh, he typically liked to work primarily with masonry, uh, stone and brick. And in this house, we see a couple of other um, elements that were common in, in his designs, at least for the residences, was the interest in using sort of gridded geometries or sort of decorative sort of, you can see square porthole windows there to the left of the front door and other sort of gridded geometries as decorative elements, both on doors and window openings. And again, we're seeing a lot of similarity there in the plan with this sort of exuberant wandering floor plan plentiful curved walls, and then often the fireplace is sort of seen as an organizational element or an anchor um, to the space and how the public and private spaces are run around it. Often the, the chimneys are sort of made uh, sort of uh, far more oversized than they really need to be, but they act as this sort of visual anchor um, to the design of the house. Uh, this house in particular is a really good example of how on first glance it appears very simple. Uh, in its elevation, um, but it's really the exuberance of the plan that allows him um, to tailor this house specifically to the client as well to the site that it sits on where it's overlooking a lake and is on a sort of awkward triangular site that forced Boyd to essentially compose two front facades uh, for the building. So again, it looks rather simple here on the elevation, but you can begin to see how he pushes and pulls with the different programmatic uses and spaces. Um, again, creating uh, areas where we wanna have frame views or wide open glass looking towards the lake pushing other elements back for privacy, incorporating built-in planters uh, to sort of, again, create this sort of very um, sort of dynamic um, building. And this is actually the rear of the house, um, not the front. And then he did occasionally, again, uh, and, and Katie touched on this a bit, is that he really worked intimately with his clients and tailored the houses to them. So he still worked within uh, some more traditional elements when the client or the project called for it. So this is still certainly a, a sort of ranch that feels similar to a number of his other designs that we begin to have these more um, traditional or stylized elements like the uh, decorative wrought iron, the lighting that we're seeing, some of these decorative copper elements uh, that are incorporated onto the front facade. And then again, this sort of interest in um, using very high quality, long lasting materials like brick and stone masonry um, for the house. And again, very similar in the plans. We're not in this particular case, he didn't get his curved walls that he always loved. So again, that sort of emphasis on, even though he had a very sort of strong sense of design, things that he liked and how to construct space, um, he still tailored that to a client. So this client in particular uh, wasn't too keen on his use of these sort of curved walls for the sort of uh, interior spaces that he was creating. But still that sort of level of craft in the drawings, even sort of small details like how he wanted the chimney to appear and the placement and the sizing of the stone and the brick. Uh, there are a series of more sort of split level designs. Uh, they're all a little different. Uh, none of them sort of really fall into a more similar aesthetic. Uh, each one is sort of seems to be tailored to each client. We do see similar elements uh, that we had had on previous homes, um, like those square porthole windows, um, the corner windows, broad expanses of glass, um, but it's sort of an interesting sort of more, uh, uh, sort of arrangement of two sort of pavilions stacked uh, one, upon the, uh, one upon the other. But this is uh, just, just a little close up in those drawings, every single house always had these sort of custom design built-ins. 
uh, interest in the decorative wrought iron or metal, or metal elements that were incorporated into that. And that sort of like in contrast to the to this sort of very simple elevation there at the bottom that again has this sort of more broad theatrical entrance from the living room to the dining room, those sort of very broad, almost 20 foot wide steps going up, but almost no decoration on that sort of wall of the living room. Uh, the bar not resin, so another split level, this again is playing in the same similar set of see the uh, sort of cascading built in planters, the square portal windows, the uh, extremely oversized chimney again is this sort of anchor around which the site, uh, the, the, um, the, the house is sort of constructed around and in particular with this house, uh, although photos are a little poor, we'll see here in a second, uh, Boyd used the opportunity to have this lowered entrance uh, that first split level you were entering on the primary level of the home. But this lowered entity takes that opportunity to create a very dramatic entry um, into the living room as you sort of process up to it. And we can sort of see where that entry is at, um, the sort of layers of staircases, but it really sort of comes alive, you see in the photographs. So you have this sort of broad entrance again, the use of those sleek, flat materials. Um, and then we have the sort of open curving wrought iron staircase leading up to the sort of final and uppermost level um, to the bedrooms beyond the living room. This is uh, out of character for what, we, what we've seen so far in his design. So again, I think this plays into um, Boyd tailoring his designs to his client's desires. Um, there is no other split level design that looks like this um, in, his, uh, in, in, in the archives that we've seen thus far. It's a far more contemporary design, but still this play of using decorative wrought iron elements and then these broad and gridded expanses of glass. That's it today. And this one in particular is also very simple in its plan. So he almost uh, allows himself to the freedom to have a more dramatic roof line. But in contrast to a lot of his homes, this is a far simpler, essentially just a box on the overall plan, but still having a little bit of play uh, between the spaces on the interior. Again, very out of character for a lot of the homes that we've seen, but playing into that, uh, I think strongly that Boyd tailoring his design specifically to each client and listening to them very carefully um, about what their desires and needs were. And he did occasionally do more traditional uh, sort of two-story homes like this. I uh, might call it sort of colonial, colonial revival, but you're still seeing that interest in using decorative wrought iron elements uh, and uh, the um, sort of strong horizontality, strong horizontality that we saw in previous homes. And then his sort of little signature portal windows and items like that. And then this in particular, um, house is a good example of um, how he likes to create sort of thresholds of space or gateways in between rooms. You can see that with these sort of paired of curved um, closets that lead into the living room. It's creating the same thing for privacy that goes into the den there off of that hallway. And you see that again and again on a number of his designs that he creates these sort of threshold spaces that'll, that you sort of pass through to get into the next room to provide this sort of separation as well as a sort of sense of arrival into those adjacent spaces. And this house in particular is very biased towards the backyard, sort of really opens up with walls of glass, whereas that front is sort of very uh, sort of closed off and those sort of smaller uh, sort of punched openings. And then uh, his largest residence that we've found in the documentation, he uh, did for Adam Friedrich. Uh, uh, Adam Friedrich was the sort of largest scale uh, contractor and builder in the city of Rochester at the time. And this speaks a lot to him. We heard this a lot from Boyd's son, as well as others is the level of respect that a lot of the people that worked in the uh, building trades had for Mr. Boyd and for the level of detail and care that he took on every single project and the oversight that he provided for his clients to ensure that the projects met what he designed and what he specified. So I think it speaks volumes that essentially the largest, most important contractor at the time in Rochester knew exactly who he wanted to work with um, to design his house. And so this one essentially doesn't play by any rules, but does uh, have the, it's very site specific design to fit its sort of cliffside location um, near a lake, and then has these sort of continuous uh, ribbon of a roof that undulates um, and moves and uh, relative to various spaces within the house, especially as it's sort of looking out over the lake there. And these elevations sort of, in a way, almost sort of, they don't convey that sort of exuberance that you see because of the irregular shape um, of the plan there. Again, tailored to that cliffside site. So uh, Boyd designed hundreds and hundreds of single family homes, but uh, he was not just an architect who did 
uh, those single family homes. They had multiple different types of buildings they worked on. I'm gonna show you a couple of multifamily projects and then we're gonna get into a couple of the other sort of areas that he practiced within. So the multifamily projects, just by virtue of them primarily being built for developers, they're gonna be sort of less, um, uh, less inventive, less barrier pushing per se, uh, to, uh, compared to his more sort of signature style that we're seeing with his single family homes. Um, the patio house, this is sort of placing a, trying to place a sort of small modern apartment building into a very sort of older historic context. Um, this is in the like main historic district in downtown Rochester where there's a lot of older, more stodgier looking homes um, compared to this. And so uh, Boyd sort of balances between the two. He wants to introduce this sort of flat uh, continuous roof, which we've seen again and again with a lot of commercial projects. And then there's this sort of playful nod to traditionalism with these, uh, these sort of implied shutters um, and the brick there on either side of, uh, of all the window openings. But uh, it's simple, pared back, but it was sort of celebrated as sort of this first modern apartment um, in the city of Rochester. But I think this particular advertisement is very telling that this is essentially a full page advertisement uh, in the uh, newspaper. Can anyone notice the glaring omission and the, the whole page size advertisement? They have thanked everyone who participated in it, everyone except for Thomas Boyd. Um, and that is uh, a sort of hit or miss with a lot of his projects, but that was certainly something that a number of major projects that he was involved in, unless we had the archives to look at, there was no written record. He was omitted um, and omitted purposely for sure, seeing the a level of documentation that was given to the contractors and trades people that worked on the project. Um, he did a whole number of very traditional um, these sort of garden style apartments that fit into sort of more residential contexts, um, but still introducing some sort of modern feel to it with these, uh, these balconies that sort of appear to visually float because of the very thin wrought iron columns that he's using to support those, uh, but otherwise so sort of playing far more sympathetically um, with the more traditional surroundings um, of this particular apartment complex. And again, he did multiple of these throughout the Rochester region. And you can sort of see in this preliminary drawing, um, we've seen a couple of examples. Um, he often created these beautiful color renderings often for every project he did. And um, in some ways those renderings can sometimes be sort of his initial push for what he was hoping to accomplish. And then you can see how they get sort of pulled back and made more traditional where this building initially was trying to be a little bit more modern and uh, flat and blocky with far more elaborate wrought iron and then it got sort of pared back to what we saw today. The Manhattan Meadows project was, uh, could have been the largest project that the Boyd uh, would have been responsible for in the state of Rochester. It was a, the largest urban renewal project um, in downtown Rochester. Uh, and Boyd was the initial architect for that and designed uh, this whole site plan, as well as uh, proposed schematic designs for towers and townhouses throughout um, the whole site. Um, after the initial bidding and estimating came in, it was determined that the project was over budget. And instead of working with Boyd to, um, uh, to redesign or to reassess uh, his proposed project, they fired him and hired someone else to finish the project. So we did end up getting a large complex of buildings built, but they were designed by an out-of-town architect um, who came in to sort of essentially fully redesign and fully value engineer um, what Boyd had originally been hired and identified to do. And that was similar for a number of publicly funded projects that Boyd worked with. And Boyd's son had noted that in the interviews that that in particular, really soured his taste for doing public work um, after sort of having himself burned multiple times on projects like these. These are some of the renderings that were in his archives for the project. It has a little bit more of a sort of a Miesian sort of modernism to it. Um, and another sort of series of drawings of proposed elevations, uh, rough sketches and interior uh, renderings, but again, pages and pages of this. And then instead of worked with, he was just cast aside and someone else was brought in to do the project. Uh, Fort, Hill, Fort Hill Terrace Apartments, so this is a little bit later in his career, he begins to uh, sort of change his aesthetic on how he approaches uh, some of these apartment buildings. In particular, he likes to begin to express the staircases themselves of these large vertical elements, often incorporating these continuous walls of glass and then having this sort of open tread stairs as a sort of dramatic sort of uh, element that you sort of frame the building within or uh, sort of uh, bookend, which we'll see in another uh, later project. And that's the sort of photo of it when it was completed. And the last uh, multifamily project I'll show you again, he did dozens and dozens, and this is sort of much later in his career. This is the latest one I think that we can document. Um, and this sort of is leaning a little bit more into the brutalism um, uh, sort of a second and would certainly be one of the earliest examples we have in Rochester, but has 
the sort of uh, signature corduroy block on the edges, the expressed concrete structure of the floor plates, um, and then the sort of very rigorous gridded facade um, with the sunken balconies, um, and then um, the sort of projected living room spaces. So he also did a lot of commercial projects all throughout his career, um, even very early on, um, from restaurants to car dealerships, um, to a number of sort of retail establishments. Um, and unfortunately with a lot of the commercial work, a lot of commercial work generally is um, uh, very ephemeral. And so a lot of his commercial projects unfortunately have been lost to time, but they had an exuberance about them in the interest of the modern materials that we saw in the houses, but also an interest in designing signage. I often provided sort of the sort of full design of the signage to go on, his, on the various buildings he was designing. Um, this is one of his earliest ones, the Parkway restaurant. Um, it has a very sort of sleek, uh, streamlined, modern design on the exterior and interior with sort of ribbons of windows and space along with uh, the sort of folding, uh, almost nano wall enclosure there, but uh, about 70 years earlier uh, than the current nano walls today. Um, and that's a, uh, one of the handful of interior shots that he had of that, but you can see a very sort of similar aesthetic and interest to these modern sleek flat type materials. And you'll see reoccurring with a lot of his commercial projects, the use of indirect lighting and the manipulation of the, the ceiling height to indicate various programmatic spaces within the broader open room. Uh, Times Square Hotel and Supper Club, this only lasted five to eight years, um, but has a lot of uh, the sort of signature elements that a lot of Boyd's commercial projects had the interest in using modern materials and the cladding and sort of gridded uh, matrix like facade. And then um, the sort of uh, incorporation of signage into the overall composition and design of that facade. Uh, and then also doing this sort of sleek interior rooms. Um, the Times Square Supper Club was a, for its short period of time, was a very well known jazz club. People like Dave Brubeck and others traveling and coming in. And that's the only photo we can find of it today. Uh, this is another one, the Aero Industries office. Again, sort of lost time, but you can begin to see a similar aesthetic sort of carrying through. It's the photo you saw up there on the uh, poster. And like the houses with all those commercial buildings, there's a heightened level of detail and craft of the drawings, designing all of those details and understanding how the construction goes together, everything from the built-in furniture to the wall of the building. A whole series of supermarkets in all different styles, depending on where they were placed and what communities they were going into. Again, a lot of these buildings have either been severely remodeled to the point where you don't recognize them anymore um, or have been lost time. And then even sort of more modest things like funeral homes, but places that are, you know, uh, sort of nodes or uh, uh, intimate parts of their, uh, their community. In this case, it's sort of purposely designed to look very residential in its scale and has very, a very similar aesthetic to that. And this is one of the uh, later buildings. This has some similarities to the Fort Hill Terrace Apartments that we showed with the express stair, um, the uh, stair towers, and then the sort of more uh, typical sort of gridded uh, international style facade. Okay, so uh, what I'll sort of uh, end with briefly is uh, the idea of, you know, the historic preservation mindset. So, you know, why is historic preservation important? And, you know, why, you know, being an architect, you have this sort of big ego, you want to design your new sort of heroic projects. Um, you know, what's the interest in working on and elevating the work of others? Um, and so for me, uh, buildings are a, they're collect repositories of the history and the lived experience of the people within them um, from Slocum Hall here uh, where we're sitting, uh, as well as other buildings all throughout Syracuse and how they have accrued these collective memories and sense of place um, here for in the city of Syracuse or in any municipality you might live in. And it's the sort of act of embracing and celebrating that heritage and the designers and those users associated with that make for me the, the work more meaningful um, to uh, sort of work within and to ensure a sort of a perpetuity and a growth of that sort of sense of place. And I find it that the challenge to creating meaningful and a sympathetic dialogue uh, with any existing building be they modern or traditional, um, is far more difficult to do uh, than if you just have a clean slate and a blank piece of paper. Um, and I find that, you know, particularly as a designer more rewarding, but it's also more rewarding uh, as a person to be able to participate in that dialogue with these designers from the past to celebrate their work and to make people more aware of them. Um, so I hope that you do too. And I hope that you enjoyed learning about Thomas W. Boyd Jr.
Thank you, Christopher. Uh, three great presentations. This really concludes the formal presentation. Um, Jeffrey is not, Jeffrey Harris is not gonna be able to join us downstairs. Uh, so if anyone has a question for him, uh, there he is. Um, we can take a couple of questions for Jeffrey Harris. Uh, he will be with us tomorrow in the workshop. Um, and uh, hopefully he's gonna be back in February for, for, some, for Black History Month and for uh, an exhibition we'll do then. Anyone have any quick questions for Jeffrey Harris? I suspect people have any, <laughs> we've been here for an hour, so I think people are squirmy. Jeffrey. Um, I'm not scary. No, I know you're not scary. <laughs> any questions for Jeffrey? Yes. No, I'm not gonna throw it to you. What is your question? <laughs> Jeffrey, did you hear that? She's asking, she's, uh, the student is from Raleigh, North Carolina. And, okay. and she's wondering what work you've done in Raleigh. I mentioned, I think a historic preservation organization earlier that you were involved with. Sure, um, I worked with uh, Hanbury Preservation Consulting on two national register nominations in Raleigh. One was the John Chavis Memorial Park um, in the southwestern, no, I'm sorry, southeastern section of the city. And the other was the Barry O'Kelly School, which is an old Rosenwald school in the old, um, in the community known as Method. And I also actually am working with the city again and in doing an historic context study of the city's LGBTQ historic places so that the city itself will have a roster of places to look through to see if any of them uh, really rise to the, the occasion of needing uh, further designation uh, for consideration at the state level and the national level. So those are my, those are my Raleigh ties. Thank you. Evonia, yeah. I'll just let you ask. Hi, I'm Ivania. Um, so I was, so I'm, I'm, I'm one of the only African Americans in my grade in school. And one thing I learned recently was that um, one of my professors, um, Professor Ifoma, as well as um, some people that we had last year on the panel, Pascal Sablon and Felicia, um, they had all mentioned similarly what, what you were talking about with how black architects know each other. And that is still something that's going on today. Um, what do you think that, I guess, how, could, how do you think that can change? And, and where does the, I guess, I think our school is doing a pretty good job as, as with um, raising like black architects and people of color, but what else do you think can be done to kind of change that narrative, I guess? I think in terms of how can it change in terms of uh, creating, you know, more African-American architects? Is that, is that the change you're seeking, you're talking about? Just like the idea, like, what do you think of like that still be, like happening today? Like it's however many, it's been like a, almost a century. There's like a century later, there's still so little arch black architects in general. Honestly, I, I think that there tends to be a lack of awareness on the part of particularly African-American communities of the number of architects that happen to be in their midst or within the realm of, of our history. And I think that if more people were able to get the exposure to the particular buildings, to particular sites that African-American architects have done, and people really make a demonstrated effort to point them out, I think that you have a better, you'll have a better opportunity at least of getting some younger people interested in going into the field. And you'll also get the opportunity to have uh, people who are in community to learn more information about where they are. Uh, I, would, I would add that if you think about the field of historic preservation, hang on, let's make sure. Oh, sorry, at a, at a glitch. 
Um, if you think about the field of historic preservation, there aren't very many African Americans within the field who are on the professional side. And the argument that I've often heard is that there's not a great deal of money in it, that it's history, so therefore it's boring. But at the same time, you have in community people who are wondering, well, what's, where, where are our historic resources? How come people don't know? The idea is that it's, it's up to folks like us to let folks know, you know, let folks know what we know. We can't keep this information, this history to ourselves. So, you know, I try to make it a point. I mean, it's, it's why I joined the Board of, I, I accepted the invitation to join the Board of Historic Resources uh, here for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And whenever I have an opportunity, I say yes to talking about African-American preservation issues. I will, I happily um, took the opportunity to work with the DC chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects back when I was with the National Trust so that you know we could bring in the professionals who are who are tied to this this general work together so that we could present more of a united force of information to the broader community and you know i recently talked to my buddy a uh, uh, young architect named william young he would love that young architect named william nguta who is dc based and he was the one he was the chapter president at the time when he invited me and it was a little controversial because people weren't doing preservation related work. But as a result of our pairing, we were actually able to get, for lack of a better way of putting, we were able to get work for African American architects in historic preservation and lots of them doing work in preserving African American historic resources. So I thought that was a win win all together for both the, my field and for his. And, and it got more people out there knowing that, hey, he's out here doing this work and I'm out here doing this sort of work. So that, so I hope that answers your question. That does, thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Okay, maybe one more question if we have it for Jeffrey or not. Um, okay, so uh, let me thank Jeffrey and uh, Christopher and Katie again for the great presentations. We look forward, uh, Jeffrey, to working with you tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. and then beyond that, hopefully on, on a planning and um, exhibition project here. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna break now. There's food downstairs um, and drink and such. Um, please grab something down there and we'll, we'll have just a continuation a little bit of the conversation that we had here, um, but the food is for you. So uh, let's give them all three one more hand. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Katie. And we'll um, we'll go downstairs now. Thank you.